I am honored to be among you. It's a special honor to be gathered in this iconic center that bears the deep imprimatur of my dear mentor and late friend David Rockefeller. Even in his second century, David was fully involved in life, a humanitarian in the most complete sense of that word. He would have loved to be here today. Thank you, David in absentia, for all that you did for me, for this country and planet. I'd like to particularly thank Jerry Spire for making this event possible in this grand venue. David knew because of his friendship with and respect for Jerry that Rockefeller Center could not be in better hands. I've known Jerry intimately for more than six decades as college roommate, as business partner, and as the most generous of friends. The depth and breadth of his accomplishments and his contributions to society are legion. In college, Jerry was a witness to my descent into darkness, and he has been with me and for me ever since. For that, I am profoundly grateful. The story gets told that Albert Einstein once mumbled to himself, well, Albert, what if parallel lines do meet? And went on from there to posit the curvature of space-time. Is the story true? Probably not. But I'm a fan of the story all the same. Because I happen to think that parallel lines converge far more often than we credit. They meet, of course, literally at the vanishing point, but they also meet figuratively when the attraction pulling them together is powerful enough. During World War II, for example, when two irreconcilable forces, Russian communism and American capitalism, converged to defeat the Nazi scourge. And I'm convinced that parallel lines, science virtue and civic virtue, are meeting here today in this room at the highest level, drawn together by not one, but two powerful magnetic forces. One is my sacred vow as I described in the material I sent out in advance of the gathering, a vow to end blindness all blindness into perpetuity forever. The other equally strong is the glue that holds this room together and makes me feel so blessed to stand here right now in this place among all of you. That glue is friendship. I might even call it love. I could offer hundreds of examples, but allow me just two. My wife Sue has been the center of gravity of my life even before I lost my sight when she was my girlfriend. And without her, would I have been able to muster the determination to pull myself up, put on my socks and shoes, and return to life? I vote no. With her, with her love, her compassion, her patience, and her strength, she has kept me in life, providing not only great spiritual solace, but also inspiration. In Milton's words, soul partner 
soul part of all my joys. Thou art dearer to me than life itself. To call the wide array of things my roommate Art Garfunkel did for me after I returned to Columbia as a blind student in 1961, kind or thoughtful or gracious, would be an insult to him. Those words convey far too little. He divorced himself from the life he had been living, altering his own ways to conform better to mine. Most important, he would read to me regularly. He would say, Sanford, darkness is going to read to you today. I suppose he meant that, for me, his voice was emerging from the darkness. And out of the dark, out of the silence, would come this voice I know so well. That voice is here today and is emblematic of what all of you have done to help sustain me. Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again. Because a vision softly creeping left its seeds while I was sleeping. And the vision that was planted in my brain still remains within the sound of silence. In restless dreams I've walked alone. Narrow streets of cobblestone, neath the halo of a street lamp, I turned my collar to the cold and damp, when my eyes were stamped by the flash of a neon light that split the night and touched the sound of silence. And in the naked light I saw ten thousand people, maybe more, People talking without speaking, people hearing without listening, people writing songs that voices never share. No one dare disturb the sound of silence. Fool said I, you do not know, silence like a cancer grows. Hear my words that I might teach you. Take my arms that I might reach out to you. But my words like silent raindrops fell and echo in the wells of silence. And the people bowed and prayed to the neon god they made. And the sun flashed its warning in the words that it was forming. And the sign said the words of the prophets are written on the subway walls and tenement halls and whispered in the sound of silence. I don't really have much to say after that. It just all I can say right now is thank you, Arthur, from the bottom of my heart, and thank you all. Blindness is an enemy as old as humankind. But fortunately, when vast scientific attainment in this room and unyielding civic dynamism in this room join forces, aided and abetted by deep and abiding friendship, 
even this darkness can and must be vanquished. And so it will be crucial to our effort, our, our governing council, and our scientific advisory board. And the first member of our governing council, Arthur, as I would like to call him, has performed something of such beauty, tenderness, meaningful, certainly to me, that he's spoken already, and frankly, it, it just killed me. I'd like to ask Sue if she'd be the first member of the Governing Council to speak. Let me sincerely welcome everybody here. Hello. Hello. <laughs> we're just so glad that we're in this effort together. Um, I have a, a master's in special ed and I have an MBA. I worked in Vice President Gore's office in the White House for almost eight years. Um, and Oh, the rest of the eight years, I was the National Volunteer Coordinator for Clinton Gore 96, and also worked in presidential personnel. Subsequently, I taught preschool for 13 years, where the people were much nicer. <laughs> Good one. You're right, Eric. Um, Sandy and I have three children and four grandchildren. All the grandchildren live in New York, so we need to travel a lot. Um, regarding end blindness, we, we choose our objectives with discrimination and pursue them with determination. And the, the pursuit of those objectives is one of the things I most admire about my husband. We met in, the, in sixth grade, but we weren't a couple until ninth grade. <laughs> Things move slowly in Buffalo. <laughs> I was just going to say that, that, that I share Sandy's vow and his hope that no one else will have to suffer and no one else will have to witness the misery of blindness. My name is Jerry Spire, and uh, the most fantastic period uh, of my youth was spent with Sandy and with Art in college um, until our junior year, uh, and uh, finals came upon us. And as usual, I was sloughing off while the two of them were working very hard. Sandy had gone for an exam, and I was still sleeping because my exams were the next day. And I always thought sleep was the best thing to prepare for an exam. Uh, so the, somebody knocked on the door, and... And I finally got myself out of bed and opened the door, and there was Sandy with someone that had brought him back from the gym. And Sandy said to me, I can't see. Those three words, you know, were just like a, a brand iron. I can't see. Now, what most of you don't know is that a month earlier, Sandy had been in Buffalo and w was told that he had a severe case of conjunctivitis. Uh, and um, that turned out to be absurd uh, with all the facts that we know today. So for me, uh, it, it was just remarkable 
uh, to watch Sandy come back uh, in a way that I've never seen, I had never seen before, and honestly, I've never seen since. His determination to succeed and to be part of the community that didn't suffer from his disability was truly remarkable. You know, we often use the word remarkable, but there is no peer to the effort that Sandy has put in uh, since 1961, uh, at least that I'm aware of. There's nothing in the world uh, that I've seen that compares to the energy, the effort, the determination, and surely the success uh, that Sandy has had. So for me, uh, when uh, Sandy asked me to join this board, it was really an honor. And um, I only wish that I could contribute to uh, this effort in terms of science because it, it, it is an awful, awful way to live. But despite that, Sandy has made the most of it, whether it's playing basketball with his boys uh, or fooling around uh, going to art galleries with me. Uh, and doing so many other things that he's done so well. Um, I, I consider him, you know, just the most unbelievable achiever. And surely there are many of you around this table that have achieved, overachieved uh, in your respective fields. But with all due respect, no one has done what Sandy's accomplished. I met a man named Mike Bloomberg about a quarter of a century ago when I had been recently installed as a member of the board of Johns Hopkins, and he was chairman of the board. We subsequently found out that we had a mutual dear friend and mentor in David Rockefeller a member of our governing council, Michael also serves in a very real sense as his proxy here. Like David, Michael is a man of great integrity and generosity, the personification of civic virtue. He has worked tirelessly to pull our body politic out of the mire of partisanship and lift us all to the highest level of civic involvement, my dear friend, Mike Bloomberg. Well, Sandy, I, uh, I don't know who you were talking about, but it was very flattering if it applied to me. Um, for the record, as Bill Brody knows, I, my academic record was I always made the top half of the class possible. <laughs> and I did that in high school, college, and graduate school. So uh, I'm not gonna compete with any of you and your research, that's not my expertise. Uh, I was very lucky uh, to uh, know Sandy and uh, his two roommates in college, uh, Art Garfunkel and Jerry Spire. Um, anyways, I've been lucky enough to um, get involved with Johns Hopkins. I went there to study physics in 1960, and um, I'm one of those people that never reads the instruction manual. Anybody can put it together to read the instruction manual. I always try to do it without reading the instruction manual. So I never looked at the course catalog. And when I got there, I found, much to my amazement, that German was a requirement if you were a physics major because in those days, everything had come over after the war and a lot of it wasn't translated. Three days in German class and I changed the engineering school. 
there was no chance of me learning how to speak German, much less physics. But anyways, for some reason or other, Johns Hopkins gave me a degree, and um, I uh, went to uh, Harvard Business School, uh, and then was headed to Vietnam. I had a commission as a second lieutenant in the Army, and in those days, that was in 1964, or 66, Everybody was going, and I don't. Most of you are too young to remember, but we did not rip up draft cards. We didn't move to Canada. If you drafted, you went. And I had a chance to be a second lieutenant, and I thought I would be safer as a second lieutenant than as a private. Little did I know that second lieutenants were the ones all killed by American troops. A dirty little cigarette because they fragged them, as they called it, because they didn't want to have somebody take them out into the jungle. Um, and you would not have survived as you were a second lieutenant. Anyways, I have perfectly flat feet. If anybody would like to see them, I'd be happy to show you afterwards. I, I tried to show that to the Daily News who wrote that I was lying about how I got a deferment, and they wouldn't even look at them. But I was lucky enough to get a job because they, could, they wouldn't take me. And I went to Wall Street. Fifteen years later, I got very lucky. They fired me, and then I started a company. And that's worked out very well, and it's made a lot of money. And um, with that money, partially, as much as anything, because of what I learned at Hopkins, not just as an undergraduate, but also when I was chairman of the board and Bill was the president of the university, um, I learned about what science could do and how we could change the world. And it just made so much sense to me to try to do things before rather than pick up afterwards. I couldn't understand why everybody didn't do it, and I just sort of made a mental commitment that I'm gonna do it. Nobody's gonna feel sorry for me. I do live reasonably well. I'm heading off tomorrow to fly out to California for a two-day golf tournament, but don't, that's okay. Uh, but anyways, I decided that I would try to make a difference, and the Hopkins is the main thing, but uh, my foundation gives away, you know, last year we gave away about $750 million, and this year it'll be a little bit more than that. And then I made a big gift to Johns Hopkins Really, uh, the uh, Ron Daniels, the president of Hopkins, was the impetus behind it um, to, con to give them the wherewithal to make uh, Hopkins needs blind. Anyways, um, I got involved in public health through Al Summers, who was the dean of the School of Public Health at Hopkins. He's still, he's on the board of my foundation. Um, and he's been the inspiration for me as to what we can do. Uh, and I've tried to support a number of things, one of which is Wilmer, one of which is Sandy's cause of ending blindness by 2020. Um, I've always thought that when uh, somebody that I've funded wins a Nobel Prize, I should get part of it, Eric. I don't know who funded you, but uh, none of most of it. I, I just, I did get a call once from somebody from the Nobel Prize prize committee, and I thought, oh my God, they're going to give me a Nobel Prize. No, they wanted funding. They were running out of money. <laughs> but I was impressed that they understood what I could contribute and didn't confuse that with some gobbledygook that wouldn't make any sense. Uh, anyways, um, I'm a big believer that we can solve some of these problems, uh, these scourges like blindness um, and uh, lots of communicable and non-communicable diseases, and all it takes is focus. And sadly, the average person doesn't understand, and our government certainly does not understand. It is a disgrace what the government's doing in defunding research and in not uh, accepting science. Um, I can't quite explain why they do that. I did give a speech at the Democratic Convention back in 2016 uh, saying that uh, Donald Trump was not the right person for the job, which is a nice way to phrase it. Um, but nevertheless, uh, why, I, it's not just Donald Trump, it's, it's everybody. Uh, Congress is not willing to stand up and take the grief. And one of the differences I've always thought between business and science, in science when you go down a path that turns out to be a, 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 a dead end, uh, you've contributed something because we know not to waste our resources going down that path again. Uh, unfortunately, in uh, government, you can't do that. It, government does not permit you to fail, and you can't do things that are controversial or innovative with public monies, and so we don't innovate as much as we should. And I'm a believer that the private sector, while too small to really fund 
solutions to the big problems of the world, whether education or it's problems in medicine or whatever, uh, what private, the private sector can do is to uh, do innovative things and show the way and be a role model. And then let the government, with the power of taxation, scale it up for everybody in the city, state, country, world, whatever. Um, and so that's what I've been trying to do, and I'm honored to be able to help uh, cure blindness. Um, Sandy's always been a role model of mine. Um, Sandy's one of these guys, and I have another one who is paralyzed from chest down. All of a sudden, he had a, a, a capillary in the, in the artery that goes down your spinal column, breaks, and his, he, he was fine in the morning, and by noon, he was paralyzed for the rest of his life. And this is a guy who has nothing but smiles on his faces. Uh, he lives two blocks away, and he and his wife, he in his wheelchair, and my girlfriend and I go and have dinner every two or three Sunday nights. And he just plays the hand that he got and tries to make the world a better place. And I think that describes uh, Sandy. Uh, he uh, has a great attitude. He has aspirations. He has hope. And Sandy, you are a role model for all of us. So I will be able to give some money. Do not expect me to be an um, optometrist, ophthalmologist, or all of those different things. All I know is the other day, I hate to admit this, but I got up and I'm trying to read something and everything's blurry. And for about the 10th time, I realized all of a sudden I'd forgotten to take my lenses out the night before. So I now had two lenses in and it doesn't give you double the vision, it's less. Anyways, thank you for having me, Sandy. All the best. Michael, thank you for taking the time to join us. John? I'm, I'm John McCarter and I'm not a roommate. All these roommates talking. My um, maternal grandfather was a country lawyer in Morocco, Indiana, and he lost his sight to glaucoma in 1930. He had a driver who would drive him around to the county courthouses where he would plead his clients' cases. Morocco was 30 miles south of the main line of the New York Central Railroad. And every year before Christmas, he would be driven to the rail stop where he would pick up a barrel of fresh oysters. And then he would distribute these to his clients and his family. And hence began our tradition of oyster stew on Christmas Eve, which we continue to this day. From Illard, Willard Ice, who was blind, I learned the state of Illinois Revenue Code. From Tom Joe, who was blind, I learned how to use Titles 4A and 16 of the Social Security Act to provide federal support for public assistance. And in the town next door to ours is the Hadley School for the Blind. But all of these peripheral dealings with blindness pale next to my experience with Sandy, whom I met in 1966 when we served together as White House fellows. Sue and Sandy and Judy and I regularly have Sunday brunch together. And one Sunday, Sandy asked what I was doing that afternoon. When I replied, I'm going to the National Gallery, he asked if he could come along. And there followed a most memorable museum visit, probably no more than 20 paintings examined over a three-hour period. My narration responding to Sandy's questions on source of light, patina, color, perspective, artist, groupings of subjects, and even the fabrics represented. He slowed me down. He made me look more closely than I ever had. He demanded more in penetrating the artist's skill and the story told by the painting. Sandy has told me that his blindness make, enables him to concentrate deeply and over long periods. The document describing the prize which we have all received reflects that concentration and probing and is the most beautiful document I've ever read. So my, son, my friend Sandy has taught me the importance of patience 
of empathy and fortitude. He has enhanced my life beyond measure, and it is an honor to be with all of you in this marvelous adventure. Um, I'm Michael Mukasey. Um, I was lucky enough to know Sandy at Columbia College when um, I was then two years behind him, and I was one of several people who uh, helped him fight blindness in the only way then available, uh, direct and primitive, and that was to read to him. Um, and um, he was determined at that time to graduate with his class, and he did. Um, he is determined to do what's outlined in the statement that we've all gotten, and by God, obviously, he will. Um, he has a level of determination and of insight um, that I have, that I find unequaled uh, in anybody that I've ever met in my life. And I feel privileged to know him, and I feel privileged to be here. I'm Bill Brody. I had the distinct pleasure to meet Sandy and Sue uh, when I became president of Johns Hopkins University in 1996. And um, over that period of time, following my retirement for Hopkins and then moving to the Salk Institute and retirement from that, Sandy has been not only a constant friend, but an advisor. He's one of the most the connected, wisest people that I know. And whenever I had a difficult problem that I didn't want to share with uh, other people within the university, Sandy was my go-to person. Um, he is a wonderful person, uh, as you all know. And uh, I should say I have a personal interest in this. My father um, was an ophthalmologist who happened to have type 1 diabetes. And he developed diabetic retinopathy. We lived in Northern California. He actually flew to Boston Eye and Air, Harvard. And they said, there's nothing we can do. This was, he contracted and, and went blind, had to give up his practice. Um, just a few years before laser treatments came into being. So um, I have personal experience uh, with it, and I am delighted to be uh, on this committee. What I'd like to do now is to turn to the scientific side of our equation. We do have signposts to plant, uh, awards to present, the not too distant future, and we are attempting to light a pathway to a world where everyone can see through science. And this is where the chairman of our scientific advisory board, Dr. Jeremy Nathans, becomes crucial. Dr. Nathans has produced a remarkable volume of work at the Wilmer Eye Institute at the Institute for Basic Biomedical Sciences at Johns Hopkins and at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. His research spans the fields of genetics, neuroscience, ophthalmology, and the molecular mechanisms of visual system development, function, and disease. Now, all of that is beyond impressive. But what I treasure most about Jeremy is a casual comment he once made to me in the course of describing his work. He said, what we do is to pry the secrets out of nature. I think really that's why we're all here today. Jeremy. Thank you, Sandy. Um, let me just get the ball rolling by saying just a very few words about each of the SAB members around the table, and then each of you will say a few more things about yourself, whatever you think would be useful about your career and interests. I want to start with Joan. Joan, Joan got us in the groove uh, with her comments about her work. I'll just say that she's been one of the leaders, world leaders, not just in uh, clinical treatment and research, and especially the quest for better treatments for macular degeneration, this, this anti-VEGF approach, which is really revolutionary, but also in a, a kind of a quiet leadership, building the Harvard department to its uh, eminence today. And so, Joan, we're very honored to have you here. 
Uh, Julia Heller, who is sitting next to me, is also uh, a remarkable leader and uh, one of the great retina surgeons in, in the world today. I should say she attached my mother's retina. Did a great job. <laughs> um, she, was she was a good patient. Yeah. Uh, Julia uh, is the president of Will's Eye Hospital uh, and uh, physician in chief at Philadelphia. Connie Sepko, uh, to my right here, is a professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School and a pioneer in the study of uh, the development of the vertebrate retina and in tracing and identifying the paths that neurons take generally uh, throughout the CNS. Uh, Jim Tsai is the chair of uh, the New York Eye and Ear Infirmary and Mount Sinai uh, Department of Ophthalmology, an expert in glaucoma. Uh, he came to New York uh, from the chairmanship at Yale, a very distinguished clinician and leader. Richard Axel, uh, at the end of the table, is uh, one of the world's leading neuroscientists and uh, has made extraordinary contributions in molecular biology, uh, sensory biology, and now uh, the brain systems that analyze the senses. Josh Sains, sitting next to Richard, uh, is also a pioneer, uh, especially in the way that neurons develop and hook up with each other, and in particular, uh, beginning with the neuromuscular system, how nerves and muscle find their right partners, and now more recently, more recently being the last 20 years, uh, how the retina is built, uh, literally how it's built from the, the ground up. Uh, Eric Kandel, uh, who's next to Josh, uh, needs no introduction, but I'll give one anyway. <laughs> Eric, uh, of course, uh, is a pioneer in the study of learning and memory. He was trained as a psychiatrist and uh, really developed um, a remarkable uh, experimental system, a very simple system uh, that uh, brought us to the core of what the molecular and cellular basis of learning and memory is. He's also a remarkable spokesman for science and uh, a highly accomplished author, uh, not only of neuroscience uh, books, his, his textbook, which is simply referred to as Candel, uh, has been the Bible of the field for a generation, uh, but also more recently books about art and the brain. Uh, and uh, it's wonderful to have you here, Eric. Um, and then John Dowling, next to Eric, is uh, one of the greatest retina biologists of all time. He has done extraordinary work ranging from the chemistry of vision all the way to the structure of the retina, the development of retinal neurons, especially in uh, a system that he developed, a fish, a simple genetically tractable fish system, the zebrafish, which has spawned an enormous number of insights. Um, and John actually is um, returning to his morphologic roots in looking at the structure of the human retina, and his most recent research project is to define at the highest resolution, at the electron microscope level, the precise arrangement of cells and their connections within the human retina. Well, th thank you. I, I think I'm Joan Miller. I think I speak for all of us at the table to, that we are honored to be a part of this endeavor and really uh, you have a remarkable tour de force of the, the four of you and your uh, associated others. So thank you for sharing that with us. It's, it's really just wonderful to hear. Uh, I'm a Canadian. I sort of snuck into the U.S., uh, went to MIT undergrad and then got stuck in Boston and never got out, much to my mother's dismay. Uh, I ended up in ophthalmology and then in the retina field uh, because I was attracted to uh, the surgery, which was a lot of fun, and the fact that there were so many retinal diseases that did not have great treatments. So I combined uh, translational research with clinical practice and ended up working on diseases in the retina that were uh, affected by abnormal blood vessel growth and worked with Judah Folkman uh, to try and understand those better. and and dabbled in a treatment that ended up being the first treatment for wet macular degeneration called Visudine, which was a drug and laser combination which seemed to at least halt the process. And at the same time, we were trying to figure out what drove the blood vessels and discovered uh, the role of vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF, which then led to a lot of treatments that are used for millions of people around the world uh, annually. So that was, you know, a lot of excitement. Still get to uh, work in research. Uh, but at that point, uh, the leadership at our Harvard department had you know, some struggles, and one of my mentors 
turned to me and said, you know, you've had this fun and some success, but it's really time for you to give back to the institution and create an environment for young people to be able to do what you did. And I think the motherhood in me sort of fell for that. And I became the chair of the department in 2003. And that has just been a wonderful experience, uh, except for all the horrible HR stuff that you have to do. But the, the good side of that was really trying to uh, build teams, uh, which is something I really uh, like to do, and help further our uh, engagement in ending blindness. Uh, and in fact, our motto at Mass Ear is that every child born today shall be able to see and hear through her lifetime. So we, we go after the deaf thing uh, too. Uh, but I think it's, it's great to have aspirational goals. And uh, what I see is that the biggest unmet needs in ophthalmology to address blindness are, are really retinal diseases and optic neuropathies like glaucoma. You know, there are others also. And so going after blindness altogether is a great thing. Uh, I think one of, the, one of the areas where I would like to work harder and I've tried to uh, build collaborations beyond just an institution is really to have an, a multi-institutional effort to sort of really uh, gather our resources and all sort of pull in the same direction. I rode crew too, so you know, it's sort of the whole team thing. Anyway, thank you so much for including me, and it's an thank honor to be John. here. So I, I'm Julia Haller. I'm the ophthalmologist in chief, as, as Jeremy was just saying, at Will's Eye Hospital. Um, my training is as a retina surgeon scientist, and by virtue of that skill set, and by virtue of being at great places, uh, serendipitously, including 27 years at Hopkins uh, and, and 11 years now. Uh, at Will's Eye Hospital, I've had the opportunity to be uh, on the bench to bedside spectrum on the bedside or operating room side or slit lamp side in the case of ophthalmology many times of some of the transformational developments that have occurred in the last two decades in ophthalmology and it's been quite a ride. So Joan's talking about the anti-VEGF re revolution that has totally transformed macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, retinal venous occlusive disease, and I, I had, was able to be one of the first two people to inject Lucentis in a human eye back in 1991 or so, and to help with the trials that led to those drugs being used in humans and the huge impact it's had on, on blindness worldwide. Technologically, um, so many new advances have helped uh, in this fight as well. So long-acting uh, drug delivery devices that have enabled many of these pharmacologic advances to be delivered over longer periods of time. Uh, retinal implants that have literally uh, biblically brought vision to the blind in, in the case of uh, retinal prosthetic developments that uh, it's been a privilege to be on the surgical side of implanting in humans. And then recently with gene therapy, I was uh, so proud to be one of the three surgeons involved in the Luxterna trial run by Spark Therapeutics that recently garnered FDA approval for the first treatment for genetic diseases in humans. Uh, since coming to Wills, I have turned my attention uh, in many respects to access to health care, um, disparities in health care. For example, in Philadelphia, over half of the people with glaucoma, there are probably 100,000 cases of undiagnosed glaucoma in greater Philadelphia. Jim is a glaucoma specialist, so he knows this. So we have wonderful treatments. We have miraculous new therapies. Obviously, there's still unmet needs, but we're not getting those therapies uh, to many, particularly in underserved communities. And so research on um, new strategies for reaching those people, telemedical solutions, the, that's uh, very much part of what we're looking at now. And also shifting into, in, in the world of, of big data sets, looking at data analysis uh, techniques like artificial intelligence and machine learning to give us clues that can help us search for new therapies and also for better ways to reach those uh, so desperately needed the therapies that we already have. So this morning I got up early, finished a couple of cases in the operating room and almost missed my train uh, because there was an issue with a 15 year old who slated to undergo some gene therapy later this week. And as I was straightening that out and rushing to the cab, I thought, okay, this is, this is my inspiration. <laughs> I get up every day amped up by the courage and determination of all these patients uh, who are trusting us to help them. So that's, that's why I'm here. Thank you, Julia. Um, I'll just say a few words about myself. Um, 
Actually, we heard uh, from several people around the table about family members, um, and there's, I think, an inspiration that one gets from one's parents and other relatives. And I'll just say that since Julia didn't mention it, that Julia's father, Alex Haller, was one of the great pediatric surgeons. He was, I think it's fair to say, the father of pediatric trauma surgery. Uh, and he was a, a wonderful man, an enormous inspiration. He was um, a, a real advocate for children's health in every respect and a, a giant at Johns Hopkins. Did I get that right? Okay. Anyway, I, I actually uh, had a little inspiration from the folks also. Uh, my father is a scientist. Uh, but mostly, uh, I've had wonderful mentors. Uh, so I'll just, I'll just say something about a trajectory here. Um, I'm more on the basic science side. Uh, of course, I have a great interest in clinical applications, but I think it's fair to say that um, for many of us uh, in the science world, uh, there's a sort of a spark, a, an excitement about just figuring out how the beauty of the natural world works. And I, certainly for me, that's a great motivator. I, I think it's also fair to say that when we look at a system as complex as the visual system, one thing that is striking is that all of the information to encode it is encoded in a single linear sequence of letters. They're chemical letters. It's the letters in the DNA. And there aren't that many of them. It's only three billion. And we know that most of the three billion, the vast majority, are probably junk. It's probably on the order of a few hundred million or millions of them that are really the relevant ones. And I think the great challenge of science today is to figure out that code. How does the DNA sequence generate the final organism, that the health or disease or susceptibility to disease? And that's the window through which I have come into the vision world. And I've been fascinated by the way that uh, the visual system is built, how it's encoded in our DNA, how errors in those DNA sequences can impair vision, and how we can use that knowledge to correct those impairments. Hello, um, so I'm Connie Sepko, and I'm in both in the Department of Genetics and the Department of Ophthalmology, Jones Department. Um, and just reflecting on this question about inspiration, um, so my lab started studying how the retina develops many years ago, and about 15 years ago, I got a phone call, um, and it was from a man named Alan Schwartz, and he had just, his grandson, his newly arrived grandson, was just diagnosed with a disease that would lead to total loss of vision, and he was asking me, well, what am I doing about that? And I said, well, nothing. I'm a basic scientist. We're just trying to understand how cells develop. We don't really do disease. I think you have the wrong person. Um, but he said, well, if it's your grandchild, what would you do? And I said, well, I'd work on it, and I'd try to get everybody I know to work on it. And after I hung up, I realized, well, maybe there was something we could do. So, in fact, the cells that we were studying, photoreceptor cells, were the cells that were deficient uh, in his grandson. So since then, we started working on that. Um, and so we still do basic science. We try to understand, as Jeremy said, um, how do cells, in, in our case, how do cells decide to be a photoreceptor cell or how do cells decide to be a ganglion cell? but also then what goes wrong in those developmental decisions. And many of the genes that lead to blindness are genes that direct the development or the function of these photoreceptor cells. So we're now trying to use gene therapy using viruses. So I was originally trained as a virologist. Um, we're trying to use gene therapy that will allow many people with different kinds of disease genes to respond to a gene therapy vector. And we now have several treatments that work in mice, and we're hoping that we can start to move this forward to larger animals and eventually people. Okay. I'm Jim Tsai. As I mentioned, I'm a glaucoma specialist. And, you know, I've been dealing with a disease um, <clears throat> which has frustrated a lot of great clinicians for years, this blinding disease. And when I was at Columbia, and at Yale, I had ran, had ran a small lab and we started working with other scientists trying to say, how do we bring back vision in patients who've lost it from glaucoma? And it's very challenging because you have to get the optic nerve to grow out and make connections to the brain. So I had the good fortune of working at Yale with, I think some of you know Steve Stripmatter, starting to work on 
ways to unlock this regeneration potential. And so now as chair, I try to recruit great scientists to carry on the work. And I've had the good fortune of recruiting brilliant scientists from Connie's lab and Josh's lab. And I do believe that there is an opportunity to really unlock all the exciting science. I do really think that we will be able to figure out ways to regenerate, uh, especially retinal ganglion cells. I'm actually on the board, a scientific advisory board of a company that's been started called Renet X Bio, which is founded in New Haven from Steve Stripmatter's lab. And some of you know Jeff Goldberg and I on the scientific advisory board because we are trying to get valuable research done in terms of how do we restore the neural networks. So I, I'm just honored to be part, I'm so glad Jeremy asked me to be part of this because I'm sitting around you know, giants in the vision research field and I'm just delighted to just offer my two cents, so. I'm Richard Axel um, and I do not work on vision. Rather, I try and understand how the physical world is represented by nerve cells. But actually, I'm a scientist by default. Um, I, I went to medical school, but my clinical incompetence was recognized very early. And I was allowed to graduate with the proviso that I promised never ever to practice medicine on live patients. And, and so I agreed and I kept my promise by doing pathology. And um, I went into science and I've been at Columbia for f over 50 years. And um, in those 50 years, I have never sat on a committee. Uh, yeah, yes, especially at Columbia. And, um, and then I had lunch with Sandy. And um, he asked me to join this committee. And through his words, I, as a cynical, untrusting academic, recognized perhaps for the first time a true triumph of the human spirit. The man is just remarkable. Um, he showed me that it is possible to not only endure, but to prevail. And I broke 50 years of promise to participate in this um, endeavor. And I really feel it's both pleasure and an honor to be part of this. So I'm Josh Sains. Um, I'm at Harvard in the, I direct the Center for Brain Science there. And as Jeremy said, um, kind of the motivating big question of my research has been how synapses form, the connections between neurons uh, at which they pass and process information. Uh, and I began by working on how synapses form using the neuromuscular junction because it's a fairly boring synapse, but uh, one that one can study in greater detail than other synapses uh, deep inside the skull. And then about 20 years ago, I kind of switched a little bit to working on how uh, the proper synapses form, how during development with uh, thousands of types of neurons in a relatively small space, they sort out to form the complicated circuits that underlie uh, all our mental activities. And I chose the retina because again, one could ask questions there uh, in detail, uh, even though deep in my heart, I wanted to study uh, the cerebral cortex and mental illness. Um, so that was very basic research. And about five years ago, I began switching from studying the retina as a model system to studying the retina for its own sake, to really learn something about vision. Um, and that hasn't gone very far. It's still a basic research lab. But we've begun to work on the human retina what are uh, the cells and molecules in the human retina that help humans have so much higher visual acuity than mice do? Um, what are the parts of the human retina that are 
uh, impacted in diseases like macular degeneration that can't be studied in mice because mice don't have a macula? Um, what are the ways in which we can help uh, neurons regenerate when they've been damaged, uh, either by traumatic injury or glaucoma? Um, and so I wouldn't say there's a single inspiration. Uh, it's true my mom had uh, macular degeneration and was treated with Avastin with great success for many years, and that sort of gave me a, you know, up-close view of how medical advances can really transform lives. Um, but in fact, it's more about coming to a stage in life when one wants to take very basic research findings and um, move them a little bit more to something that's going to be of uh, eventual, far after I'm gone, clinical significance. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Eric Handel. I'm at Columbia University, and I work on the biology of learning and memory. And my work showed that learning involves a change in the strength of connections between neurons. And short-term memory <coughs> involves a functional change. And long-term memory involves an anatomical change. There actually is a change in the number of synaptic connections between the interconnected cells that mediate the behavior. And that's produced by an alteration in gene expression. So if you remember anything about the discussions that we're having around the table, you not only will have an anatomically different brain, but the genes expressed in that brain will be somewhat different than the ones that were expressed beforehand. And will we live forever? You, I can't promise that. <laughs> but I promise you that one of the things that strikes me, that's the next point I want to make, is that um, I'm Jewish. That might not come as a surprise to you, but I'm a Viennese Jew. I was born in Vienna. And what always strikes me when I listen to conversations like the one we're having today, how different it is to have this conversation in the United States than to have it in Europe at any time. The formality of the situation in Austria, for example, would really inhibit discussions of the kind we're having and certainly the kind of jokes we pass around here. So it's hard to realize because we benefit from it every day how wonderfully congenial life is. And what you're doing, Sandy, is an example of that. It's not that common in Europe for a person to suffer from a disease, to generalize that not only they want their specific form of the disease, but the general category of disease cured, and to recruit people who will actually help do this. So I think this is a wonderful reflection of what is best in American science, best in American philanthropy, and best having friends around this table. I'm John Dowling. I'm at Harvard University uh, with Josh in the Department of Molecular and Cellular Biology and a neurobiologist. I'd like to say, first of all, Sandy, I'm delighted to be part of this effort. To give you a little background, I do have ophthalmology in my lineage. Both my father and my brother were ophthalmologists, but it was not either of them that really brought me into vision research but a professor at Harvard by the name of George Wald who discovered the role of vitamin A in vision. Everyone around this table heard his or her mother say, eat carrots, they're good for your vision. Why? Because what gives carrots yellow is a substance called carotene, which when it's broken apart, two molecules of vitamin A. I joined George Wald's laboratory as a junior at Harvard and uh, he sent me on a project to study vitamin A deficiency, to make rats blind, which I ultimately did. And uh, that was both my undergraduate research and then my graduate research, studying vitamin A deficiency. After getting my PhD, I should say to begin with that I did head to medical school initially, used to come back to the lab, enjoy it, after two years, decided to take a leave of absence. Next, this year is my 60th year on that leave of absence. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going back to medical school. <laughs> anyway, to make a long story short, I decided that research was really what excited me. Worked again on vitamin A deficiency initially, light and dark adaptation, then got involved in an inherited retinal degeneration, rats that had uh, a retinitis pigmentosa-like disease, which does happen also in humans, 
And then I became interested in what happens proximal to the photoreceptors. Because, of course, the retina of the eye is much more than an array of photoreceptors, but a little neural circuit that uh, starts the processing of the visual image. And, of course, the optic nerve then carries that processed information to the rest of the brain. And I say the rest of the brain because it's important to realize that the retina is a true piece of the brain pushed out into the retina, pushed out into the eye during development. So over the years, I've been very interested in using the retina as a model piece of the brain, first studying its wiring, how the cells connect with one another, then the electrical properties of the various neurons, then the chemicals that neurons use to communicate with one another, and then the genetics somewhat of the retina using zebrafish that Jeremy happened to mention, and I was also interested in their marvelous uh, color vision, which is better than ours, by the way being tetrachromatic, not trichromatic as we all are. Uh, and then it got to be the point when I had promised my department I would retire at age 75, close my lab, which I did. But then I've joined the laboratory of one of my colleagues who's developed techniques to serially section pieces of neural tissue and what we're presently doing, and I think Jeremy mentioned this, is trying to reconstruct down to the synapse level the fovea of the human eye. So we've come full circle back to the work that I started doing back in the 1960s. So Sandy, it's a pleasure to be with this group and we are going to restore vision to the blind. I thought I would ask Jeremy to take a few minutes to discuss the process. We now have a final set of guidelines for the prize, which will be awarded, as I think everybody knows, on December 14, 2020, in the Supreme Court. I hope and pray that all of you have that marked in your calendar. Now, Jeremy, if you take a few minutes to describe how you see the process going. Sandy and I have been discussing this for the last uh, year and a bit, and our thinking is that we, we don't want this to be like the Nobel Prizes where the money goes to one's bank account and you can do something more or less public spirited with it, that the goal is to change the world and to basically make this an investment in improved, improved and successful treatment of patients towards the goal of curing blindness. So uh, the money is earmarked for uh, that purpose, and uh, it can be given to either individuals or to a consortium, to an institution. For example, it could be to a hospital or a clinical group or a research group. We want to survey the entire planet, and this, this, is, this is the entire planet. This is not just the United States here, and pick whoever we think are the best people. So between now and approximately one year from now, that's what we're going to be doing. So... Um, we will ultimately have to make a decision about how to uh, divide the emphasis between research and clinical work and things in between. We'll also have to make a decision about uh, where in the world those individuals will be uh, and what the goals of their work are. It could be more uh, sort of first world medicine, it could be third world medicine, it could be a combination. Uh, Julia mentioned the problem of access, that's certainly a major problem. It's not just a question of devising better treatments. It's a question of getting them to the people who need them. Uh, Senator Chris Coons will be calling in, in a, at about 2 o'clock if the Judiciary Committee is recessed. Chris Coons has been a very important part of our endeavor. Art, as you know, was the first person to make it public internationally. And on the domestic side, Chris Coons asked Rand Paul to join him for a bipartisan colloquy on the floor of the United States Senate. So that we do have bipartisan support. Hello, Chris. Hey, Sandy, how are you? I'm doing great. I just wanted to tell everybody assembled here a little bit about you, if I could, just as a, a personal matter given the times we're living in, Sue and I are very proud 
that we are counted as friends of a person whose life and intellect and character embody all that is best in America. And I can't say too much more about Chris except that he was a founder of this effort back in 2012 when he led Rand Paul, a Republican, to do a colloquy on the floor of the United States Senate and started us off in extraordinary fashion. So, Chris, whatever you would like to share with us, we would be very anxious to hear about it. Uh, well, thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Dr. Greenberg. Um, I, I want to thank you and Sue for your exceptional uh, perseverance, uh, for your leadership, uh, for your courage, uh, and for what you're doing with this transformational effort to restore sight to millions who live in blindness. Um, I wish I could be there with you in person today, but I'm, I'm glad to have the chance to talk with you by phone as you're beginning the process of selecting a winner uh, of the remarkable Greenberg Prize. Um, as you just said, Sandy, it was seven years ago um, that I lured my colleague, uh, Dr. Rand Paul, a, an ophthalmologist, um, into joining me in a floor speech on the U.S. Senate floor uh, to highlight your bold vision for a world in which uh, human blindness is eliminated. Um, the statistics that I shared in that floor speech were, were pretty stark, that something like 39 million people worldwide uh, were living without sight, many of the world's poorest countries, uh, at a time when 80% of blindness uh, could be either prevented or cured. Um, and knowing personally what those statistics mean uh, in the lives of those affected, um, you, Sandy, uh, looked um, to one of America's shining moments for inspiration and a model. Um, you launched a moonshot to address human blindness uh, and committed what's now $3 million in gold um, to the cause. Um, I'll tell you that um, just for a touch of humor, it, it was the gold that really um, sold Rand Paul because he and his father are long known to favor a gold standard and that seems to be the part of it joining me. Um, Fort Knox. Uh, just as the word from my home state of Delaware, researchers at Children's Hospital um, had seen breakthrough results in early phase clinical trials of a new gene transfer technique. And their work uh, has seen very promising results for every patient uh, participating in their research, including children. Um, all the way on the other side of the country, researchers have made promising advances in the development of the first artificial retina, uh, which has led to the first FDA approved retinal implant, um, giving those with complete retinal blindness an unprecedented level uh, of sight. These are just two examples of the kinds of successes uh, that your prize is helping to encourage or incentivize. Um, and I think, to your point about this being a polarized environment, um, successes like these and the human needs to which they're responding um, helps make medical research a priority uh, for senators, even in an environment where our president uh, is proposing a budget that flashes uh, NIH research uh, and other uh, basic and applied research. Um, two months ago, literally today, um, I hosted Dr. Francis Collins, who's the director of the NIH, in a visit to the University of Delaware, um, and uh, talked with him about uh, his concerns about proposed cuts uh, to the NIH and then to translational research around the country. Um, and when those cuts were proposed last year, uh, my colleagues and I stepped up in a bipartisan fashion uh, not just to block those proposals, um, but to redouble federal investment uh, in medical research by adding another $2 billion to NIH. Um, but I think federal dollars are just a small part of the picture. Uh, part of what we need is bold research, um, is risk-taking, um, and is discovery that leads to innovation. And that's why, um, Sandy, I'm so excited to celebrate um, your great work, your commitment to building an ecosystem to support research that benefits so many uh, makes us a great model. So um, I just wanted to conclude and say I'm inspired uh, by the work uh, I've been reading up on from researchers across the country. I'm inspired um, by the work that you and many of the folks who are there with you in the room today um, have been funding or encouraging or leading. Um, and I'm really motivated, Sandy, by the philanthropic spirit um, that you and Sue have shown in committing uh, your time and your resources to this effort. And I'm really excited uh, to hear about your decision and then ultimately um, to uh, hearing the winner announced next December. 
Thank you, Chris. I understand that you've had some other things to do today. <laughs> and so I'm therefore all the more grateful that you took some time off to attend to those of us in the private sector. And thank you again for representing the best in America in the United States Senate. Of course. Thank you. And good luck to everybody um, working through the prize process. And I'm so excited uh, to hear more from you in the month ahead. You will. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Danny. Take care. Take care. Okay. He's, nice he's a terrific guy. Uh, he really has gotten together some of the best people in the Senate to support this effort. And he is, as you could tell, very interested in the research budget of NIH. I believe that we here today have taken perhaps the first of the final steps toward ending the spirit-crushing burden that blind human beings have been carrying for more than six million years. That is in the finest tradition of America, and that tradition is best articulated, I believe, by President Kennedy when he said, I am certain that when the dust of centuries covers our cities, we too will be remembered not for victories or defeats in battle or in politics, but for our contribution to the human spirit. May God bless you all.